Every year, around 30,000 people are reported missing in Australia, and in 2020, there were 396 victims of homicide. Overall, the country's homicide rate is much lower than the global average, and there are only 2,600 long-running missing persons cases open at this time. While largely considered a safe country, its unsolved cases are some of the most terrifying. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two grisly cold cases from Australia. But first, I'd like to thank Keeper for sponsoring today's episode. When you're as locked into investigative work and researching cold cases as we are, you're bound to have plenty of confidential information, important digital documents, and a bevy of passwords to keep under lock and key. And in today's day and age, the risk of cyber criminals breaching your security and wrecking havoc on your digital database is higher than ever, leaving you wondering, how am I supposed to keep everything organized without compromising my safety? The good news is we have an answer with Keeper, who we thank immensely for being the sponsors of today's video. Keeper is the number one password security app across all modern day devices, designed to thwart cybersecurity threats and data breaches from taking your own, your friends and families, or your business's passwords. With Keeper, you can methodically create complex and unique passwords for each one of your accounts without ever dealing with the hassle of forgetting or worrying about theft as they are stored in Keeper's state-of-the-art encrypted vault. The vault's not only for passwords though, it also secures any files you want to protect as well. Best of all, Keeper Unlimited is available to you at an unbelievably low price of less than $3 per month. For a cup of coffee, you can receive the surefire security you need to keep all your data safe and passwords that will never be forgotten. Keeper is also simple to use. You first add a new password to Keeper's system, a vault where an unlimited number of entries are stored. Then you can check Keeper's intuitive password check to validate its level of strength for ultimate protection. In the end, you'll have the highest level of security for the lowest level of concern or financial strain. So don't wait any longer to secure your digital keepsakes. Click the link in the description and use our promo code at checkout for 30% off. And now let's dive in with today's mystery. Rosemaria Loria. On the afternoon of October 9th, 2006, 68-year-old Rosemaria Loria, a former hospital laundry worker, left her home on Inverness Street, Brunswick, Victoria. At around 2 p.m., she told her sister Natalie, who lived next door with her husband, that she intended on running errands in Coburg. Before she left, she said, I'll see you tonight. That was the last time Natalie saw her sibling alive. Five hours later, at around 7 p.m., firefighters were called to the scene of a horrific blaze at a beachside reserve in Frankston, around 43 miles from Rosemaria's home. The body at the center of the fire was identified a week later as Rosemaria's. Her shell-shocked sister couldn't understand what happened. Why had the 68-year-old gone to Frankston? She was not known to have any business or friends there. By all accounts, Rosemaria lived a rather reclusive life. She'd cared for her and Natalie's elderly mother until her death, and outside of that, the only person she saw was her sister. Locally, the area in which Rosemaria was found was known for drug dealing and other criminal activity, and it's unclear why the elderly woman had decided to venture out into such a rough part of town. Authorities initially thought she'd been abducted. It seemed like the only way to explain how she'd ended up so far from home in an unsavory area that she was unfamiliar with. Talking about her death, homicide investigator Sergeant Kanye Josephs noted there was, quote, some degree of burning from the tea tree above the deceased, but I could clearly see it was centralized on her body, end quote. Rosemaria wasn't in any sort of accidental blaze. She'd been targeted. But the question is why? Detectives also revealed there was soot found in her nasal cavity and that she was alive when set on fire. 
She likely died from smoke inhalation or from toxic fumes from her burnt clothing. Following the identification of the body, investigators began scouring through hours upon hours of CCTV footage, hoping to find and understand Rosemaria's last movements. It was discovered that she caught the tram from Brunswick to Flinders Street Station after leaving home, and then subsequently stepped on the train to Frankston. Surveillance footage then showed her at Frankston Station. It is believed that the 68-year-old accidentally got on the wrong train, but it's unclear how she managed to do so. According to her sister, Rosemaria was coherent and still maintained all her faculties. One witness from Frankston Station came forward to tell authorities that Rosemaria had approached her for help at around 4.30 p.m. Reportedly, the 68-year-old appeared distraught, and the conversation the pair had indicated that she had gotten on the wrong train. She asked for advice how to get to the bus stop. It's unclear why she didn't simply look for a train back to Flinders Street Station. Following this conversation, Rosemaria and the witness parted ways. She then went on to the Pier Hotel, where she went to play on the slot machines. This was somewhat usual behavior for her, as back home, she was a regular at the gambling machines in a nearby hotel, but online sleuths have wondered why she stopped to play the machines if she was so distraught about being far from home. It's been speculated that perhaps she took a moment to find comfort by doing something familiar, or that she simply needed a rest. Rosemaria spent one and a half hours by the slot machines and had no further interactions with anybody during this time. She left the hotel at 6.30 p.m. From here, she could go one of two ways, towards Frankston Township or to the foreshore. She chose the latter route. Witnesses at the time recalled seeing a group of men near to where the 68-year-old's body was later found. They also remembered hearing a woman scream. According to investigators, quote, they saw one of the males appear to ignite a flame in one way or another, and another male exit from that immediate vicinity. Other observers saw two men turn their backs when they noticed people looking at them. Authorities theorized that Rosemaria was an easy and vulnerable target who was attacked for her money or jewelry. But even to this day, the brutality of the crime has detectives baffled, with one officer noting, quote, there's no real explanation as to why you would burn someone like that. Six days later, Frankston police received a phone call from a man who knew several details of the crime that were not publicly known. He appeared to have further information and said he wanted to continue the conversation, but asked that officers picked him up from a Dandenong shopping center. The call was made from a public phone box. Following this, officers were dispatched to collect the man who was later seen on CCTV wearing a distinctive bright red jumper. However, he wasn't there when the police arrived. He was seen on the same surveillance footage leaving the area shortly before officers reached the center. Authorities believe that he panicked and had second thoughts while waiting to be collected. Both accident and suicide have been ruled out of the investigation. In 2017, Rosemaria's case was featured on Channel 7's Million Dollar Cold Case, the show is similar to the UK's Crime Watch series, as it presents cold cases with the hopes that somebody watching will have a lead or clue that could help solve the crime. Million Dollar Cold Case also offers a reward of one million Australian dollars for information leading to a conviction. Despite this reward, however, Rosemaria's case remains cold. Ravel Balmain Born July 11th, 1972, Ravel Sabine Balmain was described by her loved ones as beautiful, talented, and as someone who had everything going for her. So when she suddenly vanished in the mid-1990s, her family were left distraught. In November of 1994, Ravel was preparing for her fourth cabaret tour as a hostess. During this trip, she would visit Japan for six weeks and by all accounts, was very excited about it. At the time, the 22-year-old was living in Sydney and working part-time as a model and part-time as a high-end escort. She worked for two agencies, Select Companions and VIP Escorts, and went by the name Misha, but she planned to quit both of the jobs in the coming weeks so that she could focus solely on her showbiz career. She was known to have a strong passion for dancing. On November 5th, Ravel's mother, Jan, waited for her at Newcastle Station. 
The two had planned to have lunch together before the 22-year-old left for Japan. However, she never showed up. It's unclear why Ravel didn't contact Jan to let her know she wouldn't be coming. Instead, at around 4 p.m., Ravel met a client in southeast Kingsford, a suburb of Sydney. Afterwards, she intended on meeting a friend named Kate Brentnell for a drink. She called Kate at 7.15 p.m. and suggested they meet up at the Royal Hotel in Paddington as she was just leaving for her client's home. But once more, Ravel didn't turn up at the scheduled meet. That evening, the 22-year-old's boyfriend of six weeks, Piers Fisher-Poland, who worked in the film industry, reported her missing. The following morning, her mother, Jan, also filed a missing persons report. On November 6th, Ravel's bag, makeup, diary, keys, and credit cards were found scattered around several local Kingsford streets. One of her shell-studded, wedge-heeled shoes was found in a public bin, while the other was found on a separate street. Investigators immediately turned their attention to Ravel's last known client, a man named Gavin Owen Samer, who was 26 at the time. According to Samer, he and Ravel entered into a private agreement after the appointment was over at 6 p.m., and she stayed with him for another hour. At 7 p.m., he dropped her off at the nearby Red Tomato Inn before returning home alone. There were no witnesses who saw either of the pair at this time. Additionally, it was noted that Ravel's passport and plane ticket were found near his home on the morning of November 6th. Samer's girlfriend at the time, Michelle Oswald Seely, who was in Brisbane on November 5th, told authorities that she called her boyfriend several times that night, but he didn't answer until 9.22 p.m. When he picked her up from Sydney Airport two days later, he had scratches on his neck, chest, and fingers. He even had a bite mark on one finger. She also noticed that his car had been cleaned out and the couple's bedsheets had been freshly washed and hung up to dry. Samer later told investigators that he had paid Ravel partly by check, but he was unable to produce the stub from his checkbook, claiming it was missing. The owners of Select Companions, Zoran Stanojevic and his wife, were interviewed, but were never considered persons of interest, despite the fact that Zoran gave contradictory evidence to the police about his whereabouts. He denied having anything to do with Ravel's disappearance. At the inquest, the deputy state coroner, John Abernathy, noted that Gavin Seymour, the 22-year-old's last known client, had the opportunity to kill her and was the main person of interest. However, there was no known motive. Seymour, for his part, maintains his innocence even 27 years later. The inquest also explored the possibility that Ravel's employers were involved in her disappearance and considered a submission from a group of three men about the drug-fueled parties they had with the 22-year-old, but this later claim was deemed as unreliable. Zoran and his wife were eventually ruled out of the investigation. Ravel's boyfriend, who was unaware of her escort jobs, was also ruled out as a suspect. A statement obtained in 1999 by The Good Weekend claimed that a friend of another of Ravel's clients said the following, She's 10 foot under, and no one will find her body. That's what you get for moonlighting and ripping off the brothel that she worked for and drugging clients, stealing all their money. Basically, the owner of the brothel wanted her dead because she was destroying his business. While the statement was given by a man named Jeremy Coughlin, it was reportedly said by his friend, Mark Coulton. Coulton, a client of Ravel's, dismissed the statement as complete rubbish, adding that nobody knew what really happened to Ravel and he just heard a rumor. In 1999, the inquest concluded that Ravel was murdered by a person or persons unknown, and from here, the case stood still for nearly a decade. In 2008, investigators began re-examining the case, eventually reopening it. A cold case unit went to the former home of Seymour, where Ravel was last seen, and collected forensic evidence from the scene. This led the 22-year-old's family to believe there were major flaws in the initial investigation, and they weren't wrong. Back in 1994, Seymour's car wasn't searched until nine days after Ravel went missing. Furthermore, investigators never asked for the clothing he wore on November 5th, and his home wasn't searched until November 8th. When officers finally entered the house in 1994, they did not bring in forensic specialists and instead relied on their own eyes to spot hair, blood, and scuff marks. Notably, this was not Seymour's last brush with the law. He became reclusive after Ravel's disappearance and moved to Tasmania, 
but he moved back to New South Wales in 2018 to plead guilty to theft charges that were filed by his own sister. In 2019, Seymour was found guilty of assaulting Rosa Rosenberg, an elderly woman he was meant to be caring for, although this conviction was overturned in 2020. He was also accused of committing sex offenses against her, but the charges were withdrawn when Rosa ended up dead. She was killed in January 2020 by an explosion in the home they once shared at Bondi. At the time, a New South Wales ambulance spokesperson said the explosion was possibly purposeful and was reportedly being treated as a mental health incident. More recently, Seymour has refused to comment on the allegations made against him by Rosa and is uninterested in talking about Ravel's case, although he did tell Daily Mail Australia following his 2018 court appearance, quote, I'm one of the softest, nicest blokes on the planet. I'm mellow, totally anti-violence. In 2021, following the announcement that a $1 million award was being offered for anyone with information leading to a conviction in Ravel's case, authorities were contacted by someone anonymously who sent a photograph of an unidentified man along with their information. Investigators believe that this man may have information about the 22-year-old's last movements and believe the photograph was taken in the mid-2000s. They are asking for the public's help in identifying the man. Ravel's body has never been recovered, and a reward of $1 million is still available for anyone with information leading to a conviction. Tragically, Ravel's parents have since passed away, but her sister continues to look for answers, stating that when her sibling disappeared, Quote, it felt like a piece of my heart was ripped from my chest. If you have any information about either case we shared here today, you can call Crime Stoppers anonymously on 1-800-333-000. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.